Welcome back. We're going to talk about uh, merging and unmerging at Family Search tonight. Okay. If you're a patron of Family Search, you learn quickly you're going to read, need to handle duplicate records and replace them. And the easiest way to do that is through merging. Now, a long time ago, I thought merging was going to go away. That eventually, we'd get all the duplicate records and get rid of them and merge them. We'd be done with that. Well, unfortunately, it seems like every day there's a new set of duplicate records out there. So this is a process that's going to be around for a while, probably forever. In this presentation, we'll focus on how to judge if two records really are duplicates and need to be merged. And then we'll discuss how to unmerge or how to undo merges that have already been done. And with that, use the new merge analysis tool that Family Search has developed. Okay, well, what needs to be considered when we do a merge? There's four main things. There's names, dates, places, and relationships. You need to look at all four of these as you prepare to decide if two records need to be merged. Don't focus on just one of them, but try to focus on all four. So let's look at these. First are names. In the given names, there's a, a lot of things you need to be aware of. You need to watch out for. In given names, if people could be using nicknames or they could be using the middle name instead of the first name for their person. And people are often recorded differently on different documents. And so even though they're coming from official records, there may be uh, two different people in tree that are totally identified with totally different first names when they're really the first, same person. On the surnames, you need to be aware of the fact that uh, women start out using their maiden name, but once they've been married, you're usually going to find them under the married name. And if they have multiple marriages, then it becomes even a more sticky situation because they may be going by a former married name when they get married again, things like that. And then also surnames can be spelled differently. And that's something that we just have to deal with. Don't expect surnames always going to be spelled the same. And if you use just names alone to, to do your merging, you're probably going to cause a lot of problems. So beware, look at the other factors. Dates don't always have to agree. There can be transcription errors. People could be guessing dates or maybe not even have a date for, for, for a fact or a person. Dates need to be factored into the equation, though. They can help separate similar people. But just because the dates aren't exactly alike doesn't give you a reason not to merge. And realize, too, that a lot of beginning researchers like to guess at dates, and that causes its own issues. Places, well, one of the big things you have to be careful of is that place names change over time. And some people will use the name that occurred at the time of the record, whereas other people will use the current name for the place. This is often happening in Europe when you have like Poland, an example. Is it a German version of the name or a Polish version? I do a lot of research in Maine. Well, back in the 1670s, there was no Maine. It was really Massachusetts at that time. And so you might find a record that says it was, this thing occurred in Scarsboro, Maine, or Scarsboro, Massachusetts in 1670. Well, this, Scarsboro, Massachusetts is the correct answer, even though Scarsboro is not in Massachusetts today. And one of the ways to get around this is find as many records as you can about the person so you can see the different locations. 
and beware of censuses. I have a grandmother, great grandmother, where every other census, her birthplace changes Ohio, then Pennsylvania, Ohio, then Pennsylvania, back and forth. It's like, would you please make up your mind? So you got to be careful about places. And one of the things you've got to really be careful about is either constructing a family or if you find a family, you know there's a problem. Like when the parents are, say, both born in Connecticut and die in Connecticut and the children are all born in Massachusetts and die in Massachusetts, there's probably something wrong there. Lastly, are relationships. This one, that's one that I really like to use if there are relationships to help you. Sometimes there's records with no relationships and you can't even use relationships. You know, try to look at the family as a whole, checking the parents, spouses, the children, the siblings to see if there's clues there that can help you with deciding if the record needs to be merged with something else. Often the other data, the, the names, the dates, and places can be messed up to various degrees. But if the relationships are all indicate the two people are really the same, then more than likely they are. If the dates and places agree, but the people are totally different people, then that's another story. And you probably have a bad merge that's already occurred. And you need to look at that before you try merging. So to review, what have we learned? The first thing is when you're doing, considering a merge, look at names, dates, places of the person and their family members, especially review the relationships that are on the records. Then in addition, there are some other things you can consider if they exist. One is look at reason statements given for the data or prior merges. Look at the, the uh, latest change list to see this. Uh, look at the sources attached to the two records and see who's named in those sources. That's a good, good hint to the actual identity of the person in the record. Look at discussions to see if there are any good discussions on these people look at their notes, and especially look to see if there's alert notes. Many of us are taking the opportunity to fill in the alert note with messages about people that have sticky uh, records or have problems involved with them or people are misidentifying them on a regular basis and trying to help guide you not to go down that path again. And so please look at those. And then one last suggestion, if you're going to merge a bunch of different records that all need to be merged, like a family where there's multiple copies of the parents and the children, don't start at the children's level. Start at the top with the parents. Put the parents together, even though that makes a mess of the children. But then you can go down through the children and systematically merge them together until eventually you have the single family. It works a lot easier to do it from the top down, parents first, then children. Okay, a simple merge. David Throwbridge, Linda, Lydia Holmes, they have a child, Lydia. And on the father, it says there are two possible duplicates. Well, the two duplicates both look like this one. This is one of the two. It has no spouse. It has no parents. It just has a David Throwbridge by himself. The dates uh, uh, and places of birth and death are virtually identical to the David Throwbridge that is shown in the upper right or upper left corner. So it's obvious that these are probably the same person. If you look at the change log, you know even better than it is because these two records were originally connected to Lydia Holmes and were a bit, were separated from her probably during a prior merge so that now they're cut loose and they're floating around in cyberspace. The one nice thing about it was there was enough identifying information that they came up as possible duplicates. So a simple solution is just merge them in with the David that's already married to Lydia Holmes. There won't be any problem. 
This one looks easy, but we've got John Abbott, Alice Berwick. They have several children, nine of them, including my ancestor, Elizabeth Abbott. And the interesting thing about them is that John was born in Huntington, England. Alice was born in Ireland. They came, both came independently to, to America, to Pennsylvania, married there about 1720. We don't have an actual marriage date. All their children have records that indicate they were born here in the United States, in Pennsylvania. When we were looking at Alice, we discovered that she had a possible duplicate. So, okay, let's look at it. Well, at first glance, this sounds like this is the same family. We've got John Abbott for a husband, Alice Berwick for a wife, and an Elizabeth. You know, there are some variations here. In this case, uh, it does say that Alice was born in Ireland, dies in Pennsylvania. The death date's a little different than the death date that's in the original record. And this daughter is showing as being born in Dorset, England, whereas the Elizabeth in the original family is born in Pennsylvania, and she is. So now there's a problem, but it looks so much alike. It's like, what is going on here? So even though my first, my gut judgment says this is not going to end up being a match, I'm curious as to why it's so much alike. And so let's look at the daughter's record because this appears that this relationship on the right was created because of the daughter's and one record that she had. So when we look at her, she has one source, and you notice in her record that there's no birth date or death date. There is a christening date. So most likely that source is her christening record, her baptism record. <coughs> Excuse me. And sure enough, when we look at the transcription of that record, she is a definitely baptized in Dorset, England. Notice that her parents are John Abbott and Alice, not Alice Berwick. So this probably is not the family that we want because the child Elizabeth that's in our family was born in Pennsylvania. And the Alice in this record really isn't an Alice Berwick. It's just Alice, according to this record. And it's the only record they have of this child. Now, if we look at the two Alice's that they want us to merge, even though at this point they look identical, almost virtually identical, um, we're going to mark them as not a match because it does not lead to the family that would be the same family as ours. Now, before we finish doing that, in this case, we're going to do some things that I normally would not do. But I think this Alice record has been doctored by the, a patron. And she's added the surname and she's added a birth and she's added a death and a burial. None of these things are found on that record that it came from. And so in this case, I'm going to delete those and bring her back to where it's just an Alice record with no birth or death or burial. And then when I go to do the not a match message, I'm going to say this record for merging comes from an infant christening of Elizabeth Abbott of Dorset, England, that names parents John Abbott and Alice. The Alice in this record was edited to look like Alice Berwick of Pennsylvania. This is not a match. So I go through and give, give a clear description of what happened here as I possibly can. And once I, I click the save on that, they will you'll no longer see that record as a possible match to Alice Berwick. Now there's two Esther Burroughs in tree. Esther Burroughs, one of my ancestors. She married William Big Good. It's well documented that they lived in New Jersey. They were married in 1733 and they had nine children including an aunt. 
Furthermore, we know Esther Burroughs' parents were Samuel Burroughs and Hannah Roberts. So, I mean, this is a well-established family. Looking at Esther, we find two duplicates, two possible duplicates. One, an Esther Burrow without an S. And remember, we said spelling can vary sometimes a little bit. And another one for a Hannah, which is kind of strange that a Hannah would show up as a possible duplicate to Esther Burroughs. Okay, there are two duplicates, and we're going to start with the Esther one first. So when we pull it up and compare Esther to Esther, they appear to be pretty good. Remember we said that the spelling can vary a little bit. Dates can vary a little bit. In this case, one's a year off from the other. And for the death, we have the same day and year, just a different month. And not having checked, I have a suspicion one of them is from a Quaker record because these people were Quakers and the other is using the current calendar. And so you're going to have the, the Quaker calendar versus our current calendar with a variation because they had different months for the year. Their year started in a different month. And some months are often off on their records. So these, these appear to be the same person. And it appears they were probably, because you notice that they were both added in the year 2012. That's up by their names at the top. These were records that were brought over from New Dot Family Search and probably hadn't been merged at the time. And they, Esther Burrow has been floating around for a while in the cyberspace and needs to be merged with Esther Burroughs, the primary record in tree right now. Okay, the other one is interesting. Remember, this was just Hannah. So William Bidgood, and it's the same William Bidgood record, has to now two different wives, Esther Burroughs and Hannah. With Hannah, it says he has Anne Bidgood as a child. Well, these are the same exact William Bidgoods. Obviously, Esther Burroughs and Hannah are different people. It is also the same exact Anne Bidgood. Well, in Anne Bidgood's record, it, there's a christening record for her, and it clearly says her mother was Esther. So the only solution is to consider that Hannah is probably a duplicate. And Hannah is probably a made-up name or a mistake, a mistranslation, a miscopy, uh, the mother of Esther Burroughs is named Hannah. It's possible they wrote down Hannah by accident. Uh, whatever the case is, Hannah needs to be taken out of the equation. And so since Hannah in this record showing on the screen is simply a name and nothing else, there's no temple work done for this person. We can just easily, without any consequences, merge Hannah into Esther and make a good note explaining that this Hannah name is done by accident or whatever. And that will remove her out of the equation and get her back and get Anne, this Anne record that's floating around with the other mother, back simply showing as a child of Esther Burroughs. So a merge here is perfectly okay. Even though normally you'd say, oh, we just cut her loose. Now, when you're doing merges, when it comes to ordinances, to make sure that ordinances never get orphaned, you're going to need to move people over from that record that's going to be deleted, as Family Search calls it, or archived, and move that person's information over in the family area into the family that's going to remain. So in this case, instead of leaving William Big Good out here floating around and Ann floating around, we need to replace by moving them over so that they go over and stay in the correct family. That way we don't inadvertently cut off any ordinances that might be made. Now, this one case is where you need to be careful Nowadays, we're able, this is from an old version of Family Search's uh, merge tool. In the new one, in most places, we're able to edit what the remaining 
record is going to show. This is the one that you can't. If you're going to merge a record out here that has no marriage record in it, when you move William over, it's going to erase the five duplicates here of the marriage information. You need to copy that information down to make sure you don't lose it. And then after the merge, go back in and replace it. The one nice thing that will happen in this case is instead of having five duplicates, there'll just now be one copy of it. Okay. Now, there's also the reason statements that FamilySearch has put out. You do not have to use those. You can just explain why you did this merge all on your own. Or... You can do a, a hybrid. You can take one of these and say, okay, I'm going to use this one and then add some information to that. The one thing you need to be a little bit careful about is clicking those add buttons. Because if you inadvertently click it twice, let's say, because you click it the first time and think, oh, I didn't do it right. I, I missed the spot. And you click again, you can end up having a reason statement like the one that's showing where you're going to have multiples of the same thing and people are going to wonder what you're doing. So be a little bit careful when you're clicking and don't be afraid to add your own info. Okay, when don't we merge? Well, when your gut instinct says there's something wrong, don't do it. That's, that's one thing you can use, but that's not a very good description of what's going on here. Uh, that this is something we need to address every time we approach a merge. Is this merge really going to work? Is this situ situation fit or doesn't fit the criteria for a merge? Well, you can look for relationships because they're vital. People with the same name can live in different parts of the world. So you need to look at that. The name variations may mean something or they just may be the result of natural variations. Locations can be a key factor, though sometimes you're going to find people want to guess. And lastly, you may run into one of the records being a really messed up record. And you can usually identify these because they'll show signs of being messed up because they have way too many children, maybe like 25 or more children. And they'll have multiple spouses. And you're going to see that children are born from the different spouses at the same time. And if this is not a polygamy situation in the church, most likely this is a messed up record. And it will be best to hold off doing any kind of merge with a record that's already messed up. And to fix it, you may end up having to if you don't have a lot of expertise going to the Family Search Center to get some help or calling Salt Lake and get one of the trained missionaries there to work with you cleaning up the record before you do any merging. But that can be a real sticky situation. Okay, here's an example of a, a sticky kind of situation. We've got an Anna Maria record that I ran into, and it shows that she's married to a Johannes Fischer, and that she's from uh, Essenheim in Germany. At least that's where it says she was born. Oh, well, I take that back. Uh, the Maria doesn't have any date in places on her record. It says there's a possible duplicate of a Maria Elisabetha Schmidt who was born in Essenheim in Germany. Maria Elisabetha Schmidt happens to be one of my ancestors. And so I know a lot about her. I know that she came to, immigrated to America and died in New York, Pennsylvania. Why is Anna Maria being suggested as a duplicate? That's a good question because at first glance you'd say, well, their names are different. Anna doesn't have any vitals, so it's going to be hard to compare at that level. And she, she's married to Johannes Fischer, and I know that Maria Elisabetha Schmidt was married to Johannes Fischel, not Fischer, Fischel. So looking at their two records, you have to kind of divide the screen in the middle. You kind of wonder if they really belong together, because 
we found Anna Maria with Johannes Fischer and her record. She's really an Anna Maria Weber, Weber. And she still doesn't have any dates of birth, death and birth. The children in that family are all born in Germany in a different locality than the Fischel family on the right-hand side who were over in Hesse in Germany, the region of Hesse. And so they really don't seem to go together very well at all. Bairns, the area that the the Fischer family's in, the Fischel family's in Hesse. They have different children in these families. They really aren't the same person, so they aren't a match. I think they were brought together because of the husband's names being similar. So what we're going to do is mark not a match and say these women are not the same person. One married a Fischer, one married a Fischel. One was from Bairn, the other was from Hess. And then click save, and they're gone. Now, sometimes merges need to be undone. How do we deal with that? Sometimes they find it easy to identify these because there'll be multiple sets of parents. In other words, a person will have two or three sets of parents, totally different people. Or they'll be a, in a non-polygamy situation, a whole bunch of different spouses and children, the children that were born at the same time. The people will be born or lived in different localities. You'll find some children in, in Massachusetts, some children in Illinois, let's say, and from the same time period. Like, what are they doing? Running back and forth between those two locations sounds unlikely and other things. So when you reach a point where you're thinking, hmm, this is a bad merge, now's the time to take a new tool Family Search has, merge analysis, and use this as your tool to identify if these two records that you're considering need to be broken back apart. Now, merge analysis is found on the Family Search. Uh, main page, what you're going to do is go to the main page and in the right hand column, scroll down and you'll find family search labs. This isn't right at currently a, a um, experiment. It was supposed to have been turned loose to all of us to be used all the time, but it hasn't been yet. So you're going to have to go into view experiments to see this. The experiments will pop up. And you're going to go to the one that says merge analysis view, and you're going to click go to the experiment. If you don't do that, you're not going to be able to see the link for merge analysis. So let's go to the experiment, then you can go back into tree, and you're going to be going to the uh, all the uh, changes log on a person to the merges and then look to see if that merge analysis link is found on the right hand side of different merges. The only merges it's going to show on, interestingly enough, are those that have been completed starting in the year 2017. Merges prior to that are not included for whatever reason. Okay, so here's the situation where we can use it. I've got an ancestor, Valentin Softel or Saffler, and he, his wife, we don't know. We developed a record for her, even though Family Search doesn't like it, of Mrs. Valentin Softel, and did the temple work for her. So she has temple work showing, including she was included in the ceilings of the children, Katharina and Juliana who were born in the 1730s. And so when we look at Juliana's record, she's missing a missing parents on her ceiling. It just has a date, but no parents. Now, uh, this is out of my personal database. This is one reason I like keeping a personal database because I have a historical record of families. 
And in this case, her work was done way back in the 70s and 80s period of time. Okay. And so on the right is the way the family shows today. Ballatin Saffler with a wife, Anna Maria Brenner, who is his second wife, who he married in 1755, about 20 years or more after the children were born. So this is obviously a second wife. And then there's a second marriage for him, <clears throat> showing no spouse, which is perfectly okay, because that's the way Family Search shows it, with the children connected there. The problem is that Juliana's ceilings don't show now. And Mrs. Valentin appears to have disappeared. So what happened to her? Did she get cut loose? Did she get merged in with somebody? We need to try to find her. So we'll look at Anna Maria Brenner's merges. We'll go to Anna Maria. We can't go to Vallotton, Mrs. Vallotton. So we'll look at Anna's merges. And it turns out that there's two merges. And this first one, where the red arrow is, shows a merge of Anna Maria Brenner and a Valentine. Just the word Valentine. I suppose this is Mrs. Valentin Saffler. So seeing that, I'm going to say, okay, let's see if this is where she was merged away. And fortunately, we have that merge analysis there because this was a merge done by a Cheryl Utley back in 2018. So it fits the time frame. <laughs> what I did to get those merges together is I went to her change log and I clicked on filter and said, let's just look at merges. And when I did that, it brought up just the merges and put them all nicely together so we can see them in a list. Okay, so this is the way merge analysis works. It's going to start and it's going to take those two original records that were merged together they're going to show you the one that got deleted or archived, whatever you want to call it, and its status at the time of the merge. Also, the surviving person's record before the merge occurred, what it looked like, and then the actual surviving person because of the merge after the merge happened. So we can look at this record right away and note that the deleted record was just called Valentine, which makes no sense in this case. It probably originally was Mrs. Valentine. You're gonna notice that the dates on the people are identical. That helped the person that was doing the merging to say, oh, okay, they need to be merged together. And if you look at the children, the children were both attached to this Valentine record who had a husband, Allerton Saffler. The surviving record was also married to the same Valentin Saffler, but only Juliana was listed there as a child of Anna Maria Brenner, which can't be because Anna Maria Brenner didn't marry Valentin until 20 years after, or almost 20 years after Juliana was born. Okay, so we can, we're starting to see what's going on with these two records. When it was done, everybody showed as being a child of Anna Maria Brenner. That was the end result of this particular merge. We know that's not true because of the marriage date. If you look down at the bottom of this comparison chart, they have the most interesting thing that we've never been able to see before, and that's what was the initial record? What did it look like when it was created initially? And both the Valentin and Anna Maria Brenner records were created according to this in 2012. What that means is that was the date they were brought over from New Dot Family Search into Family Tree. So these are both older records. They both existed separately. And in 2012, the Valentin record was Mrs. Valentine Saffler, who was born in six, about 1696. 
The Anna Maria Brenner record in 2012 showed a birth of about 1725 because of the marriage in 1755. Okay, so it's very obvious that these were two totally separate records. And they did not have the same birth dates when they were created. You'll see a lot of evolution of records from when they were created to what they look like today. And this merge tool, if you can find them in a merge, will really help you to identify what was the initial intent for the record. Well, it's very obvious that Mrs. Vallopson Saffler was not intended to be Anna Maria Brenner. So what can we do? Well, we go back to the merge on the merge screen, and we're going to click on this deleted person. And it seems like it's a, kind of an illogical thing to do, but it really works. When you click on her, you're going to see a person's record. It says person deleted. You're going to be tempted to say, okay, I quit. But don't forget that down here, you're going to see the person link. Click on the person link, and you're going to get a, a home page for a person, person page. It's going to have this big black bar across it says deleted person. This person was deleted by a merge. The surviving person is blah, blah, blah. But the thing you're looking for is this restore person button. This will, <laughs> I won't say it. I was going to say resurrect this person. That's not really true. It will bring this person back into the tree so it can be used by clicking restore person. You need to give a reason. So I'm going to say this is Valentine Sapler's first wife. She was incorrectly merged into the record of his second wife, Anna Maria Brenner. And then I click restore. Doing this will bring her back into the tree. It will bring her back with her temple ordinances, if any, and hopefully her sources, though not always. Okay, here's the end result. Allenton has two wives. Uh, the unknown wife now is identified. That's not really the main reason why we're doing it. But we now have the children under this first wife where they belong. And the big benefit from all of this is if we look at Juliana, the daughter, her parents are now showing in her ceiling to parents instead of having over here a message that they're unknown. This is how you get it back to where you can see the ordinances. You got to put the daughter into the family grouping with the parents that the ceiling occurred with, and then that will show. And we have the other wife now with no children, which is the correct way for her to show as far as we know. Okay, now another example is over in my Carter family. I have my first four generations in America are all named Richard Catter or Carter. And so it's really fun working with four Richards. In my Roots Magic, I have them identified with Roman numerals to help separate them. The second one of the four was born in 1640. He has a wife that we don't know of, so we call her Mrs. Richard Catter at least in my roots magic. And Richard Catter III had two wives, a Margaret and an Elizabeth. And we don't know either one of them's last names. We know that Margaret was the mother of the four children. And at the time of Richard's unfortunate death in 1713 from chicken box, he was married to an Elizabeth, who was not the mother of the children. Okay, so that's kind of the situation. If we're looking at Richard II's merges from his change log and after filtering to put the merges together, you see four merges, the first three on the list there seem to be okay. They're the most recent ones. But that first one has the birth dates for the two different Richards. This would be Richard II. This is Richard III based on those dates. So most likely they need to be looked at. So can merge analysis help us with that? 
click on merge analysis and here's our comparison. At the time of the merge, they're showing the two different birth dates and places. So uh, pretty obvious they should, probably shouldn't have been merged. Their deaths are only a year apart, but the problem is they're actually only 13 years apart. And there's just one character difference. On the right, left-hand side, it should be 1713, not 1703. That's a very common mistake in the family. A lot of people thought it was 1703, when in fact, by doing research, we found that it was 1713. Now, I actually did this original merge because the relationships worked out that they were all Richard II relationships. And I didn't have this merge tool to help me to dive deeper into the records. If I did, then I would have seen better that that Richard III on the left-hand side there shows a marriage to an Elizabeth Arnold. Well, we take the word Arnold off of here because a lot of people want to make this Elizabeth Arnold his wife. We're left with the word Elizabeth, which is the name of his second wife. It has a daughter in there that has nothing to do with the Carter family. The other Richard is all Richard II. Very clearly, Richard II. He's got the Mrs. Richard Catter for the wife. He's got the children. He's got the first fathers. Richard I is his father. And so it looks okay. So we know that uh, because of this, that this is probably Richard III and needs to be separated out of here. If we go back now that we can see way that the way they were created when they came over, the Richard Catter or Richard Carter one that was merged in that has a 1673 birth date wasn't created until 2020. That record definitely is a different record than the one that we started with. So it's not like the same to begin with. Um, the Richard II record came over from New Dot Family Search. And you can see that. When they were first created, they most definitely records really do need to be separated. Now, at the bottom of this, we're going to see that there's an unmerge button, undo merge button. The only trouble is like most of the time when you get to this part of the page on a uh, merge analysis, you're not gonna be able to undo the merge. It's grayed out. If we made any changes to this record that was the end result of the merge, undo merge is not gonna be allowed to be done because the system will not know how to sort things out. So since we can't undo the merge, what we can do is restore a deleted individual. And that's what we're going to have to do. So we could again go to the deleted person in the merge, click on him, get that nasty little black bar in there that says, hey, he's gone. You got to go to this other record and click on the restore person button. And then explain what we're doing, that I accidentally merged two different Richards into the same person. They're really father and son. At the time I did it with what I could see, I thought it would be simpler just to put them together. I wasn't thinking very carefully, obviously. So we put the reason in, we click restore, and we're left with this record that comes up now for the restored person. It needs a little work. We don't want to just leave it like this. The dates and places are generally pretty good. I'll have to change the, the death date to 1713 instead of 1703. I need to remove Abigail where as their child because she's not their child, but it's okay because she's got two husbands with children. She, if I cut her out of this marriage, she's not gonna have parents, but she will still have two sets of two different husbands and that will help identify her. I hate cutting a person loose and making them just float through cyberspace with no relationships. 
that's okay. Same thing happens with Elizabeth Arnold. I can remove her out of this equation because in tree, Elizabeth Arnold has parents and she also has a different husband with children. So it'll be okay to remove her and that leaves Richard, this Richard all by himself. I can copy his ID number and merge him in with Richard ID three and it will then uh, clean up that record and get it back where it belongs. Okay, in conclusion, merging is vital. We have to merge to help get rid of the duplicate people in tree. Learn how to analyze potential merges based on name states, places, and relationships. And that should help guide you on what to do. Don't be afraid to merge duplicate records. And if you make a mistake, you can, if you immediately notice that you can always undo the merge and it'll put it, all of it back exactly the way it was before. If you find a mistake later, you can still do the restore person. When you find a real confusing record, uh, look at its merges in the change log. That might guide you. And, you know, use Merge Assist if it's available for that merge to help you analyze for potential bad met, you know, merges. And if you're comfortable, undo merges or restore the deleted person. If you don't feel comfortable, don't be afraid to go ask somebody at the Family Search Center or call Salt Lake and get some online help. So hopefully this has helped you. Uh, enjoy working with the merge assist tool i think you'll find it to be a big help in working on merges especially when you need to break them thank you for being with us and we'll see you again next time